because that's just what the hypocrites do. And if you want your healing, you better put down feeling. Don't look unto the arms of flesh, for it will surely fail thee when powers of hell assail thee with singleness of I look unto Christ. If you're gonna talk it, then you better walk it.
Jesus. When the world looks on me, all they see is Jesus' face. For the life I am living, I am living by the faith of Him. For it is He that has loved me and gave Himself a ransom for me. the new year. Amen. We thank the Lord for the renewal of the spirit within our hearts each and every day when we gather together, when we contemplate the Lord in the shout of acclamation of praise or whether it's in the in the silence when you be still and know that he is God. We just thank the Lord always that his presence is with us this day. So let's just dedicate this service now to the uh, to the glory of the Lord and think upon him. Father, as we come before you now, let your mercy and your grace be upon us, Father. For we seek to do your will, knowing that your will has forever eternal principles written into them that do not pass away. Father, we seek to rest within that and be part of the glory of the Almighty God. For it is due you, Father, the glory is yours. But we, being thankful that you share that glory with us, just give you all the honor and all the praise remembering uh, to pray for those that have need, Father, those that are making their way through illnesses, those that are upon the roadways. We just thank you, Lord, for bringing us here together to worship you once more. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank the Lord. Well, we're believers, and we think that all things work together for good. So we're going to sing just that. All things work together. To those who love the Lord, all things work together for good. To those who love the Lord, so when the trials come, the happy voice says, "I remember this." To the bravest and the patient and we will see you through. for good to those who love the Lord. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. So when the trials come, lift up your voice and I confess the truth and remember this. Tribulation worketh patience and Christ will save you through. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. So when the trials come, lift up your voice on high. Confess the truth and remember this. Tribulation work with patience and Christ will lead you through. Bless the Lord. That gets us there in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're on the cusp of the new year, coming up to January 1 tomorrow. It's not a day where we usually open our windows here on earth, but the windows of heaven, they're always open in Jesus' name. Amen. Windows of heaven. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart, says Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments, he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart, 
since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy tonight. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Amen. That's why we're happy in the middle of the afternoon. And yeah. Amen. Thank the Lord. That's why we're happy tonight in yeah. Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the Lord on high. We thank the Lord that he is good to us. You may be seated. Service over Brother Kevin. We just thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. We thank the Lord for robes of white, the oh, white linen, and that no speaks of the priesthood and the sanctity yeah. of the Almighty God. Amen. Amen. Brother Amen. Kevin. So the first song is going to be This is the Now Hour by the Sisters. All right. It's the new year and the now it's hour. The now hour. <laughs> Sometimes my life gets so busy, it tends to make me dizzy, and the devil finds a way into my thoughts, into my day. That's when I need to stop and pray, the Lord's joy to meditate, to put in action all he said. And by the Holy Ghost be led. This is the now hour, it's the day of the Lord. Take the time to learn how to use his sword. And it's the now power, it's the way of the Lord. It's time to act as sons of God and be in one accord. Our lives today demand your time you always feel that you're behind and your senses make you blind there's no peace that you can find so just take a great big breath to the flesh your ears turn deaf and then you'll hear the lord loud and clear your soul is free from all fear. This is the now hour, it's the day of the Lord. Take the time to learn how to use his sword. And it's the now power, it's the way of the Lord. It's time to act as sons of God to be in one accord. The devil likes to question your ability. He even tries you with false humility. Don't let the devil talk you out of your place. Stay in God's grace by using his faith. Your confession can bring a miracle. If your eyes can look to the spiritual, you can have all that you can possess. When the spirit calls, let your answer be yes. This is the now hour, it's the day of the Lord. Take the time to learn how to use his sword. And it's the now hour, it's the way of the Lord. It's time to act as sons of God and be in one accord. The enemy will use all his cleverness to get your mind in confusion and stubbornness. And they won't stop until you fight With all God's knowledge and all His might Learn the power of a prayer in battle And don't be satisfied until you get it all Be lifted up with resurrection faith He'll anoint every action you make This is the now hour It's the day of the Lord Take the time to learn how to use his 
sword and it's a now power it's the way of the lord it's time to act as sons of god to be in one accord this is the now hour it's the day of the lord take the time to learn how to use his sword and it's a now power it's the way of the lord it's time to act as sons of god and wield god's holy sword all praise and glory next song <laughs> we'll do plenty of the praising and glorifying god Yes, it is. Amen. Every breath I take, you breathe in me, Lord Jesus. Every song I sing to you. Lord Jesus, every step I take, I walk with you, Lord Jesus, every presence, Lord, shout holy, holy, holy praise and glory, Lord, belongs to you, Lord Jesus, every breath I take, you breathe in me, Lord Jesus, every song I sing, I sing to you. Lord Jesus, every step I take, I walk with you. Lord Jesus, at your presence, Lord, shout holy, holy, holy of praise and glory. Lord, belongs to you, Lord Jesus, every breath I take, you breathe in me. Lord Jesus, every song I sing, I sing to you. Lord Jesus, every step I take, I walk with you. Lord Jesus, at your presence, Lord, shout holy, 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 holy of praise and glory. Green Lord belongs to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Bless the Lord. Sister Margot, there are no limits. There are no limits to what we can do through Jesus Christ. The Lord is our Father. He leads us, guides us, and loves us. He was the Word made manifest to counter the devil and start a new generation. He set the ways for me to go already walking that same path. There are no limits to what we can do through Jesus Christ. The Lord is my Father, He leads me, guides me, and loves me. He walked this path to show me how, and said, as I have overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, you can do it now. There are no limits to what we can do through Jesus Christ. The Lord is my Father, He leads me, guides me, and loves me. He sent His Spirit to teach us His Word by revelation, making the flesh into the Word. We are ruled by the wisdom of faith in God's Word, not by reasoning. There are no limits to what we can do through Jesus Christ. The Lord is my Father, He leads me, guides me, and loves me. Without faith it is 
is impossible to please God. We are more than just conquerors. We are his sons, and as sons, heirs to the throne of Christ. And all that God is. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Praise God for that one. And Orville and I will sing Victory in Jesus for you. And before Brother Ryan preaches, we'll sing Look Up. Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, Come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming. But he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Over and about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory! My Savior forever, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. In Jesus, my Savior forever, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory. The cleansing flood. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord God. Glory. Oh, be.
before Brother Ryan preaches, uh, look up. It's on Blue 105 if you want to look it up. Look up, your redemption draws nigh. Look up, your redemption draws nigh, draws nigh. Look up, for your redemption draws nigh, draws nigh. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your hands for your redemption, your redemption draws nigh. Look up, for your redemption draws nigh, draws nigh. Look up for your redemption, draw it nigh, draw it nigh. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your hands for your redemption, your redemption, draw it nigh. Look up for your redemption, draw it nigh, draw it nigh. Look up for your redemption, draw it nigh, draw it nigh. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your hands for your redemption, your redemption, draw it nigh. Amen. Let's thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for the vision, amen, that will surely come to pass in Jesus' name. Thank the Lord for his blessings, amen. Thank the Lord as we just look up within our hearts to the redemption drawing nigh. Sister Miriam's going to play through for us. And we're going to seek unto our God. Father, we do thank you for redemption's plan. We thank you for that which lifts us up and gives us knowledge, gives us certainty of the hope that is set before us. And Father, as we make our way toward the house of many mansions, Father God, that you've prepared for us, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. In the house of your kingdom, Father, there are many places to be, many places to walk, and it's all to the glory of your eternal name. So, Lord, as we seek the kingdom which is to come, we just pray always that we be found in your will and in your will alone. Through the name of Jesus our Lord, amen. 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 Well, thank the Lord. Amen and glory. Glorious day to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. You may be seated. Well, thank the Lord that he's good to us. Without the goodness of the Lord, where would we be? Well, we'd be in the darkness of non-existence when you get right back to the start of things. God who brought life forth and put the breath of life into us. Amen. He's blessed us thereby. And for that reason, we live and move and have our being in him. So we're thankful ever for, for that. As God bless us this day and this afternoon and on into the evening. As we do indeed ascribe greatness to our God, as uh, he's many things to us, he's our Lord and, uh, and commander as he bears those titles, but yet came to us in likeness of sinful flesh as one who is in service of others, as humbleness is a virtue, most certainly that the creator wanted to experience for himself. That's part of the wonder and the magnificence of it all. He wanted to uh, take part of that. The wisdom demanded that it be so. But how does the very spirit of truth itself, the all-encompassing presence that sustains life and brought forth all things by faith that has substance to it, how does one such as that partake of a meek and lowly existence? We have an answer. I read it out of the book. I, I cheated. I looked in the answer book. Amen. Thank the Lord. Christ is your answer. Though Lord of all, he was born in the most humble of ways. There was no room at the end, so he was born in the manger there. Learned a humble trade growing up as a carpenter's son, as it were, on the earthly plane. Even though he was no man's son, that which was conceived in Mary was conceived of the Holy Ghost. But Jesus owned no 
no property. He did not lead uh, any armies into battle, save for those spiritual kind, and looked ahead to the day of redemption, knowing he'd have to endure the cross, and he did all that, experiencing all the, the, the highs, the joy of a wedding feast, and and uh, those things, the joy of companionship along the way, and then all the trials for us to partake of our existence, learn as we do, weep at the tomb of Lazarus, and uh, again, to enjoy the, uh, the joy of a wedding feast. Well, there's foresight of strength in all those things beyond the confines of human thought. Christ being born, now that was something different. Prophesied of old, it's all, always been there. That was the stated purpose of God from the beginning, to bruise the serpent's head by the seed that would come forth from the woman. So, but uh, in practice, of course, that's something unprecedented. None of the ancient religions or mythologies came anywhere near this. But yet these things were foretold to the prophets by whom the word of God came. And all these things looked ahead. They looked ahead to the birth of the Messiah, the messenger of the covenant of Malachi 3.1. And still these things keep our sights set ahead. And so we'll speak on part two of that which looks ahead. As the mind set and the status of the heart and the soul, it's so very vital to our advancement. Again, the... What you believe is very important. I don't have one bit, one, even the most minor of doctrines that I believe in, that's important to me. We believe in those things, but it's not just that, it's the way that we go about believing it, looking at, to grow in wisdom and stature and in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. As God's word of his new covenant that was foretold of in Jeremiah chapter 31, it's one of the heart, it's the status of the heart, it's in the seeking and the finding. It's in the desire to find the Lord in his word. And there was always something coming that would be better than the workings of the rules and the regulations of the law. Those things were vital to establish God's righteousness. They're still at work today. But something better was coming. A covenant that was established on better principles. Jesus said on that subject, don't think I've come here to destroy the law. I haven't come to destroy the law, I've come to fulfill it, yeah, right. which he did. So that includes all that the prophets were inspired to write of, plus the, to keep the essence of the law in a, in a better way, in a better manner, because when you love the Lord and you hear the calling of his purpose, you just instinctively obey the commandments of the law without you, even if you didn't know what they were, you'd be as carved onto stone, you'd do them because it's your spiritual instinct out of the workings of the heart. And that's set from the beginning. When Jehovah God, Yahweh, El Shaddai, was set upon that which looks ahead to tell that to his prophets and then on to the apostles and work by the spirit of revelation. Had to do that, how could he not? As it is that the spirit of the Lord transcends all boundaries of space and time. Looks ahead, for he was and is and he is to come all at once, simultaneously. Which is a, that's, that's a lot to wrap the gray matter around. It's a lot to comprehend. but. God is an infinite being and exists on all realms at the same time. And looking ahead is part of that. As we look toward the future, it's part of the natural state of being to the Almighty because he always looks ahead to what shall be. So its course is, uh, that course is built right into the fabric of the gospel. As the Lord's always ready to meet our needs. He's ready to make his face to shine upon thee morning, noon, or night, past, present, future. His promises always look ahead to the place that's being prepared, his eyes always upon it, just like it was in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 11, when he, God told Moses that his land, his eye is always upon that, the place of his preparing there. It was so for Abraham in the, making his way uh, out of Ur of the Chaldees, 
uh, the eye is always upon it, the, uh, the kingly eye, and that uh, Moses led the tribes toward. So it's there. So that being true, if God cares for the land that's promised here below, and his eyes are always upon it, how much does he care about the land of the new heavens and the new earth? How much does he care about the city four square? The four-sided pyramid shape that's equidistant at the bottom, city four square. The new Jerusalem, the Mount Zion, which is called the very perfection of beauty itself in Psalms chapter 50 and verse 2. How much does God care about that land? How much does he care about the Beulah land in the Hepzibah country? The land of the happy union in the delightful country. How much does he care about the place where the gates are open in the daytime and there is no night? Has God got his eyes set upon that land? I think he does. How much does the self-existent one who conceived creation then expressed it into all reality, then inspired it to be written as we read it through our scriptures, how much does he care about the land of promise? Well, we have great and precious promise, and everything leads you to there. Everything within the scripture leads you to Christ Amen. and to the land of his preparing. He cares about it enough that he came to us as the word of expressive life itself, as Jesus, born in Bethlehem, raised in the Galilee region, Jesus of, as Jesus of Nazareth, brought out of Egypt. Once those that sought the child's life were uh, gone from the scene. He was brought out of Egypt to fulfill scripture. That's the same God that says, I prepare a place for you. Amen. He cares about us. And that's glorious future in Christ. It makes us all to feel like we're important. That's pretty good. I like to feel important, not self-centeredly important like that. We're just a small church. We don't have a lot of influence in this world. You know, we've got a uh, just a few people in the congregation, got a few people that pay a little attention to us once in a while out there in the, you know, the internet land, which we're grateful for each and every one that can draw strength from the things that we say. But uh, it makes us in the center of his will. It makes us to feel, because we have a place in him, it makes us to feel like we've all got a voice and what's being said and done, the great things of the Almighty God, because uh, we do. And when we get prayers answered, it makes us feel like we're being heard, like we have value in Jesus' name. And what, who was it that said, I'll leave the 90 and 9 and go out and seek the one lost sheep? There's not one lost sheep that isn't important to the Almighty. He cares about it just as much as the land that he is preparing. And that's glorious in Christ. Amen. We as a, you know, as a church, you know, right here, we're not seen as in the religious world out there today. You know, nobody even barely knows we're here. We're not seen as much a, a, of a, to be of much importance. But in Christ, no matter where it is, no matter if it's two or three that are gathered in his name in some distant corner of, of this world, amen, you're vital, you're important, you're part of the plan, your prayers are being heard, and the land is being prepared for you. Amen. And that's where we find our value. Thank Not in the things of this world, but our, our, our reliance comes from above. We know that of a certainty. Our value comes from above. And no soul gets left behind in Christ. And just to say those things, these are the promises which keeps our sights set ahead, as we need that. We all need to have instinctive vision so God gives us eternity to set our sights upon. And the newness of life in Christ makes us to be of that vision, indeed the object of it all, to be part of it. And what a great and glorious thing that is. In the consummation book, book of Revelation, we'll be in the first chapter here for a few verses. Wonderful things to consider here at this moment, the moment of the writing, as John the Apostle Revelator saw the vision 
They thought they had him all imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos. We'll never hear from that guy again. Let's stick him out on an island out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. That's the end of that. Wipe our hands away from that. Wash our hands of it like Pilate did at the trial of Jesus. Yeah, that's, a, that's the last thing we'll ever hear. Oh, God had other ideas. Amen. Thank the Lord. That was just the place. God gave him the megaphone of glory that reaches right up to us. Amen. Which penetrated into all lands and into the hearts of his children in order to proclaim his holy name. Thank the Lord. And we receive understanding by that. And by seeing the vision and hearing it, literally by seeing the voice, because in Revelation 1.12, John turned to see the voice, in the, and I, I've looked at the translation of, of that in the Greek word proskuneo. It literally, literally means to see and to hear. So John turned to see the voice as it spoke to him. He, uh, he became part of it by the partaking thereof and receiving of the vision. Amen. Thank the Lord. The station was W-O-R-D, but the transmission was going out. And John was the receiver. He picked up the wavelength in Jesus' name. He wasn't the source of the gospel transmission, but he sure became part of it as he received the signal there and became an instrument of sight. As he sees one in the strangeness and the beauty and the glory of the vision, he sees one like the Son of Man, the Son of Man referring to Jesus, a term used about 70 times in the New Testament. Some counts make it a little more than that. Uh, the Master often used that of himself. Sees one like the Son of Man, but yet in glorified form, and which brings us to verse 17. After uh, speaking about the one whose voice has the sound of many waters and his countenance was as the, sun, as the sun, it shines in its strength. And all right, which puts us at verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. I can picture that. I, I can picture myself doing the same if, if I would have been there. Fell at his feet and dead. And this is one of the most incredible scriptures that there is in, in the whole book of the Bible. It, in a book full of amazements and wonders and gospel good news surprises, this is, this is astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. And he laid his right hand upon me. Oh, my. Reach out and touch the Lord while he walks by. This is the other side of that coin. This is the Almighty God reaching out. Reaching out to you. Amen. He's reaching out to you. He's always there, hearing every prayer, faithful and true. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Well, bless the Lord. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I am. I am. Experienced death there, raised up by the power of the third day, and now I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Lord. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Those things that were. He was, he is, and is to come. So what you've seen, and things which are right now, things that'll be here, here, uh, hereafter. In fact, there's some looking ahead for you. This looks ahead, looks ahead in a mighty vision. It looks to the coming of the Lord. And write of the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. For those have meaning, which comes forth in the second part of the verse, which is the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And this is one of the markers whereby it gives identity to the vision as we're told in symbolic, metaphoric terms, uh, representations in symbol form. 
of what all these things mean. It's a basis upon which to further identify the meaning of what is seen. Now, it's not just so simple that you can just take those words in every scripture and it's, uh, give it a cross-the-board definition. Other scriptures that might use the same words may have different interpretations. That will depend on the context of which, uh, on which any revelation rests as God chooses this vis visual imaging to convey truths that are so deep, so powerful, so very vital that they must be concealed from the wise and the prudent and revealed unto babes. Hasn't God chosen the poor of this world who are rich in faith to work his word through, the, to work through those that seek him? The Lord works in such ways as so to reveal himself as to those people who seek him out of a true heart, who find the way, but then he conceals himself from others who have ulterior motives, have other motivations. It's not just for everybody. So God hides himself in simplicity so that he can speak to his own people and so that the uh, uh, enemy can't use the revelation power uh, against the Most High. As truth comes in full to a remnant seed as ever. And you have to make some faith effort, take some study, take some belief, take some interpretation, takes faith effort to reach these upper levels of revelatory wisdom. God works that way. God works through a remnant seed. Israel was not chosen because they were the greatest in number. It's because they were the fewest. They weren't the mightiest nation on earth. Matter of fact, nationhood, they were just slave rabble in another country. They, they weren't the strongest people. They were the weakest. They were not the most learn, learned. Uh, they were the least educated. And if God was to choose the powers and the towers of this world, to work through, he would have chosen the Egyptians, right? That would have made more sense. They had the power, they had the gold, they buried their kings with golden masks, that's how elaborate they were. They had all the temples, they had the finery, they had the hieroglyphic writing and communication. Uh, they, had all, they had all that business, yet Jesus came to make plain the way of salvation so that all could find life by simple faith confession on a very personal level to all nations. So don't worry about the numbers. We've got one on our side. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. Fear Amen. not, for he's the first and the last word on every subject. He's got it all covered from the simplicity of the confession of salvation to the upper room of his mysteries. It's all there. It's all there in Jesus' name. Amen. He holds the keys of death and hell, even as he delivers us the keys of the kingdom, which Peter then passed on to us by way of Acts 2.38, repentance and baptism in Jesus' name. Those are the keys to king, the kingdom. They get you entrance into life. Amen. All right, so we must look ahead to these things. And in our subject title, and that which looks ahead, what's John told to write of? It's what John has seen previously. It's of what is. John was there. He witnessed Matthew 24 in the, in the flesh in real time being there. So John's seen some of these things, but it's speaking of that which is also. At that immediate moment of, of the, the things which are now, and to our emphasis point, to the things which shall come hereafter, covers the whole spectrum of creation. So that's looking ahead in perfect continuity with Revelation 4.8. And that's the scripture of the proclamation of the four living creatures who stand in the presence of the Almighty God that say, Holy, holy, holy is he, because he was and is and is to come. Even the, they have uh, the high rank of angels, cherubim, seraphim, rank of angels, those that stand in the presence of God, they have the need to look ahead too by their nature. 
They're looking to the God who was and is and is to come. Have to have that aspect of things. So it's built right into them just the same way it is for us. Ultimately, we're all servants together of different creative orders, but still fellow servants of the Most High. So that's very much a part of the reason why they're uh, our fellow servants, though, uh, on a different created level. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 is all of God's creation has a need within to keep, keep a hold of the future, to have a vision of it, to look ahead to things that are to come. We have a need to believe that there's more to be, behold in Jesus' name, more to be lived out, more to be realized, whether it's creation above or here below, and it's vital to have such an outlook in order to get to the, uh, the right manner of, of the revelation of the Word of God. It's imperative. You, just, you have to have the forward vision. So God has planted the seed within us that brings forth after its own kind. Yeah. And uh, how much do we need to have our prior, priorities set ahead? We'll find some examples here and look to the scripture out of Luke chapter 9, in particular from verse 57 onward. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And the, the, of course the scripture is very concise. If you could see it in real time as, uh, as the minutes unfolded, it seems suggestive this was a person that was indeed in the act of walking with him along the way um, for a day, for a week, for a month, we don't know. But uh, here's the witness, a certain man said unto him along the way, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And I'm sure the person meant exactly that. But the narrative goes on. As Jesus often did, he would give an answer, not so much, of course, that's a, a, a statement, but he would give an answer or a reply or give a person something to think about of what they should be thinking about rather than what they were focused on at the moment themselves. All right, so upon that, saying, if I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. Well, that's, that's probably not the kind of answer or reply he was expecting. If you're going to follow me in Jesus' earthly pilgrimage, you better know this. Uh, I, I don't have anywhere to be. Birds of the air, they do. They have a nest. Foxes have holes. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. Are you ready for a life such as, such as this, which was necessary at that time? And he said unto another, at verse 59, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And, well, if you leave him go, you know, you might never see him again. That might have well been the case in that instance. And Jesus said unto him, let, <clears throat> excuse me, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. You see, it's a case of the master's here right now. This is, what hour was it? Oh, this was the now hour, all right. That's, a, that's the time to take up your cross and follow me. The mission beckons, and there aren't, isn't room for other things. This is when Jesus was there. This is where the word's going out. All right, let, them, let me bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. That's right. Don't look back. That was, the, that was the type of attitude, attitude, state of mind that caused Lot's wife to be covered in the cataclysm of Sodom and Gomorrah and become a pillar of salt. Probably didn't even have time to fall to the ground hardly. The fire and brimstone was upon her so fast, probably didn't even have time to fall. 
So turn, so and biblically turn to a pillar uh, of salt. All right, so here in Luke chapter nine, we, have, we see how important it is to look ahead. To see what was is given in Revelation one and four eight. That, uh, that only means you're just looking to the foundations laid that make the future in Christ to be possible. That's of a different sort. You have to have foundations. But this is the warning of letting anything stand in the way of the forward vision of the kingdom which is to come, which is the land of our inheritance. And there's just nothing more vital than this. Our witness in Christ, it's, uh, again, you know, say, we say it so often. It's the most important thing we'll ever do with our lives. It's our hope. It's our calling. It's our glory. What, what means anything if you don't have the hope and the calling of, of Jesus Christ? As we press on toward the mark, it's the one thing you do with life, with the life that the Lord's entrusted you uh, with, that has eternal value. And all the other things, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, all those things, you're free to do that. That's within his will. Again, God withholds no good thing from those that walk uprightly. He's the God of Jeshurun, the God of the upright. But you still have to have an eternal perspective that is not based upon self-centered motivations. So vital at that time. To follow him. And there's no excuses for anything else, such as are found here. Uh, no doubt looking for excuses to just leave and, and uh, so forth. God knows the heart. Another person might have said something like that and proceeded from a different place in the heart. But with these, the warning goes out. You got to know what you're getting yourself into and don't look back into other considerations. It was the time not to look back. Jesus was here. There was only just the short times. Jesus' ministry, the, the span of his ministry was very short. Just the centered upon in and around the three and a half year time period of his going about and doing good and being the teacher of righteousness. So redemption, that's always ahead of us. It's always ahead of us in the kingdom which is to come. Let's turn now to 1 Corinthians 9. By the very nature of the directive of seek and ye shall find, you know what that is? That's anti-Laodicean. What Jesus said, seek and ye shall find. Because, right? Because seventh church age message given to the church in Asia Minor city of Laodicea, the fault was that they didn't think they needed anything. We're rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing. But Jesus says, seek and ye shall find. Well, if you're seeking and finding, that means you need something. Otherwise, why seek and find? You need something. So that, that principle is anti-Laodicean. That was the fault of that church age. It thinks it has need of nothing. It's, it's complacent in that what it really does is just serve itself rather than the Almighty God Amen. and his will that is ahead. God will get down to the heart and soul of things. He'll find out what the true motivation is. But seeking and finding, it always keeps us centered on what God has implanted within. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, God's implanted faith into every scripture. He's implanted the life of Christ. It's the seed planted that brings forth after its own kind, just as it was in the Genesis account. And from verse 8 of chapter 9, as Paul is speaking of the things that have made him free, as you go to the uh, first verse of, of the chapter and so forth, and speaking about these things, the things that he and Barnabas were uh, doing in Jesus' name at that time. All right. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For, and that was a perceptive statement. Because the, the laws, the, the health and the dietary laws and the cleanliness laws, all those things which were incorporated into the law of Moses were for our benefit. And perceiving that, Paul says this, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And 
That's good for the beast that he gets to munch some corn as he turns the wheel. But that's not the primary reason why it was written. That's part of it. It's, it has its level of importance. All right, but Paul says, doth God take care for oxen? That's not, uh, after a manner, he does. But that's not the primary purpose of the commandment. The primary purpose is here in verse 10. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, for you and I, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. And we're plowing, we're turning the wheel, symbolically speaking. We should plow in hope, and he that thresheth, or gathers a harvest, in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things or planted spiritual seeds, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Well, thank, thank the Lord that he blesses us with the, the things that will pass, carnal in the sense they pass away. Uh, but thank the Lord that he gives us the harvest that, to sustain the body. But the spiritual is so much more important. So, so, so simple, so direct in concept, but so very profound, as even the beast of burden there needs to feel the hope of something, uh, of having a reward for his labors. And no doubt this is written for our sakes. It was written from the time of Moses. It was written for you that we should consider a truth that runs throughout creation, runs from the animal kingdom then on to the human creation as well, we need hope. We need that. We need it vitally. We learn that the scripture goes, goes deeper than just the mere surface judgments in order to provide insight. There are deeper le levels of revelation, even within a commandment for don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. There are deeper things contained within the word that keep us alive. Words at this level of depth set us free to find more than what's readily apparent. And Paul perceived that. No doubt this is written for us, he says, as example, because it's good for us. It's always for our sakes. A voice from heaven, when some said that uh, Jesus heard right, right before the coming to the crucifixion time, right up to time of trial, the voice was hev from heaven came. Jesus said that for, this was for your sakes. It was for your benefit. So the voice that comes from heaven is for us Amen. in order, order to find more than what's readily apparent. And just like all the trees of Eden were good for food, all scriptures are good for spiritual sustenance. All scripture's good. Amen. It's all spiritual manna that comes from Amen. above and these imparted sayings of wisdom. So just keep looking for the beauty of holiness contained within the deeper meaning. And that brings hope to us. It brings hope that is alive and vibrant and looks to the future always. In Amos chapter 9, back to the book of Amos chapter 9, nestled amongst the minor prophets who had so much to say, so much holiness contained within, even though their books were not the lengthier of the prophets, but yet it's all vital to us as the word of the Lord comes in order to lift us up and to cure the wounds that are contained within this world. We thank the Lord that all his springs, all the advantages of scripture are given to us. All the fountains of blessing, the fountains of water that sustain life, every advantage is given to those that follow the scriptures. And when all is finished of what is proclaimed, we'll get even more of the, pic, the big picture of the land of glory, of the many mansions, of the land of, that we make our way toward in Jesus Christ. And thank the Lord. The expressions we find in the book, the word of God speaks for itself. I don't know if all the languages of the world are enough to contain the glory of what is to come, but the completeness of, of it all, it will be evident in that great notable day in the, of the Lord when all things are made known in that day when the song of Moses and the Lamb is sung. 
There will be voices to sing that. Heck, how much do you look forward to singing that song on high? Amen. Amos chapter 9, from the 11th verse. This will keep you looking ahead. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. In that day I'll raise, raise it up. All right, the temple uh, being destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in the, the days of Jeremiah the prophet and being spoken of to by Amos the prophet at, at this time. That's going to be ra raised up. It's prophetic here as it's spoken in the days of the kings of Judah. But in that day, even though the temple will fall prophetically at this point in time, I'll raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all their enemies. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Esau is Edom, the descendants of Esau. And of all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Oh, that's a vision. In the language of the King James, the plowman, those that plant the seed will come out in the middle of the field and there's somebody taking up the harvest at the same time. Well, hey, I'm here to plant the seed. Well, I'm here to harvest at, at the same time. That's, a, that's where the blessings will flow. That'll keep you looking ahead. The plowman shall overtake the reaper. The planter will overtake the harvester. And the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Uh, the imagery is that uh, the hills shall, like water flowing down, they'll melt in, in that respect. God's blessings will flow down like a river. They that wait upon the Lord, amen, who get renewed strength, amen, uh, they'll see these things happen. The hills shall melt, they'll flow down with blessings. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God, because God cares for the land, and he cares for the land of his promise. So bless the Lord. So that's a it's a lot of chapter 9s, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Amos chapter 9. It just worked out that way, Luke chapter 9. Thank the Lord. Amen. What does, what does the looking ahead do to one's spirits? It, it'll, do what, it'll do this. It'll do what Isaiah's vision did. I'm talking about the Isaiah chapter 6 vision. As the God of heaven is displayed high and lifted up, his royal garments there filling the temple. In that day after the time of Jacob's trouble, there will be time of restoration, which Amos the prophet sees here for Israel. And in verse 13 and 14, I'm sure you see it right away. That's millennial language. This is language of the millennial. That's the thousand year reign of Christ setting up his kingdom upon earth. The time of Christ and uh, this, the time of the the wandering through the nations, the dispersion through the nations, that had to come first, but this is the strength that held it all together. Held it all together. Strength of the law, Jesus fulfilled it in a better way, but it's still doing its purpose. It held Israel together for 2,000 years since Christ, and now they're getting back to where God can deal with them as a people. Amen. And it'll take more yet to work his will. Again, I mentioned it this morning. They'll have to weep between the peach and, uh, porch and the altar. The priests will. For that, it'll get down to the desperate hour in order to do that. But salvation will come out of Zion's hills. And blessings will follow, so much so, that the planter overtakes the harvester. I better get out there today and plant some seeds. I've got to get ahead of the guy who's harvesting 
out there. Amen. The harvester will think the same thing. So the blessings are overflowing out. I better harvest some of it because I know that guy with the seeds is going to be out there playing. It'll be like that as the blessings flow, as the rivers flow down, the hills melt in that respect. The blessings of God flow down in a great blessing. Amen. Thank the Lord. It shall flow like a river indeed. All right, the benefits of the blessings come so fast that uh, the planter of the seed bumps into the one who's bringing in the sheaves. Look forward to it. Look forward to it in Jesus' name. In Proverbs chapter 29, just turn back to the wisdom literature of the Proverbs. Just have one scripture to lift up out of Proverbs chapter 29. All these spiritual projections, they result from keeping one's eyes on that which is to come. You have to have forward vision. It is not over until it's over. Now, prophetically, it's a finished work. After that manner, what God has apportioned, it is. So, uh, thank the Lord, all that's written, it shall be done. It's still playing itself out in, in real time in the, in the days of our pilgrimage here upon the earth. The spiritual work is always done, but it's not all finished yet here on earth. We have to keep the forward vision going and uh, keep our eye on that which is to come because that's the, it's the Lord's way. It's the Lord's way to do that, to prove himself. It's his way to display his very nature, keep us set forward for once again, he was and he is, and he is to come. So he keeps our sights set ahead, it's his way, and all things are written in order to stay in that alignment, to stay in proportion to who God is, and it does work together for good. All of it does. If you love the Lord and hear the calling of his purpose, if you don't hear his calling and purpose, it may not work out so good in your personal case, but the children of the Lord will be gathered there on Mount Zion to sing the, uh, the song that's in perfect harmony with God's will. For the prophetic work always beckons the believer, calls to him, to look ahead. That's our hope, calling, and faith. It's just essential to the soul. It's just an outlook you have to have. And you know why people are unthankful in this day and age? Why they're bitter, arrogant, rude, and worse than that, murderous, and so forth, being overcome by all the works of the flesh that are written there in Galatians 5 before the uh, benefits of the fruitful spirits of the Lord are, are listed, but all those works of the flesh, <clears throat> they're overcome by that, and they're certainly out there. Uh, why are they in such a state? They don't have anything to sustain them. They don't have anything to feed them spiritually. It's all, at best, it's just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That won't sustain you spiritually. That just becomes, that, yeah, that might last for a day, but it just becomes desperation in the end. And a lot of people out there in the world feel that, and they're, because they have the spirit of Cain and the seed of the serpent, and uh, let that overcome them and not partaken of the blood which heals all things, uh, drives them to madness, and, they, and they, thus they do what Psalms chapter 2 says, in that it asks this question, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? All that goes into it. So it's all desperation in the end which turns to bitterness and every wicked work. All right, our, our scripture and Proverbs will speak to that condition. And, uh, and it certainly seeks to, seeks to the condition that should prevail and does prevail in Christ is all prophetic scripture has to be done according to its inspiration. Always the battle is the Lord's. It's his. It's his responsibility. We do have our part in it. But God will keep track of the details. But your level of agreement, of course, depends upon you. Follow me. As Jesus said, that's always the commandment. When it comes to eternal virtues, don't look at any other thing when the commandment comes. And there will be a, a voice to listen to that's like that, a voice that thunders in the latter days. All right. The 
Proverbs 29, the verse is 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. As the essence of the statement is to stay on the forward path. When you keep the law, which is not just the commandments on stone, not just that, but when you keep the law, the books of Moses and all the writings of the inspired prophets that came after and the historical scriptures and the doctrinal and uh, the prophetic books, to keep the, uh, the wisdom of God's contained within the Proverbs, but it has a prophetic will written within the fabric of it. And it provides the foundation of all that would be written in the future, the law, taking it all together, everything that was written by the apostles, every red letter word of Jesus that was spoken. It was based upon those things which were written, and that's eternal. It looks ahead to that which is to come just by its very nature. And without guidance of eternal principles, there would only be, at very best, disorder. Disorder and every wicked work of the most desperate kind. At worst, it'd be the calamity of darkness to us all. Because where there is no revealed word, the people perish. You have to have vision. You have to have that which looks forward to beat back the forces of darkness. And the, the content of what you hold to be true, all those things written, they have to come together and work together along with the right spiritual attitude in the manner of which you believe. It's all forward vision. It's all looking ahead. Without that, we perish. But I'm here to proclaim that we're alive this day and that hope is alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Thank the Lord as we seek unto his judgment that comes from above. We thank the Lord of what we've been granted with. We know that every word of God is pure. It's all to bring glory to his name, which we're going to sing that song. It's on Green Book, page 196. Glory to his name. Get a little blood applied to our hearts. Amen. Glorify the name of Jesus. Thank the Lord for the blessings that we see. As we see it was so for John there upon the Isle of Patmos when the one like the Son of Man reached out and touched him there. Thank the Lord that he reaches out and touches us with his hand. Thank the Lord that his mercy is there. Thank the Lord that his mercy is ever abundant. His mercy endures forever through his word and through the vision of scripture that forges the pathway of our life and keeps us looking ahead in Jesus' name. So uh, thank the Lord as uh, we bow our heads and pray. We're going to dismiss with prayer. We thank the Lord for the blessings that we have this day. Sisters may play through. Oh, there! thank you, Father, for being our glory, for being our good word from on high. This word is good. It's good. It's the, the more the word is a cure for anything in Jesus' name. It makes us to run, Father God, leap over a wall in Jesus' name. It brings us to the very gates of heaven that are open in the daytime where there, in the land where there is no night. We thank you for the vision of it. We thank you for your presence being among us. We thank you for the word of healing that's gone out, the word of comfort that sustains our spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the seed of hope that's planted within, that keeps us on the vision. For the, where there is no vision, people die. People perish without it. But Father, we have a book of vision. We have a book that looks ahead and teaches us the way that we should go. So this is the way. Walk ye in it as we follow the way, the truth, and the life of your holy word. And we thank you for it. Father, Lord, bless those that are in need, need of healing, need of strength to meet the challenge of the day. Father, be the light unto our path that makes us to uh, walk even through the valley of the shadow of death. You're around me, Father. There's no darkness that the light can't pierce through it. So we thank you, Father, for being our help, for being our light that's set before us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, glory to God. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Thank the Lord that he's, we're here with us. Thank the Lord. Glory be to his name. Thank you, Lord.
Let's all go down to the room. 